Okay. We have baptism and communion today. So um, I was going to uh, talk about lovers of self rather than the lovers of God in one session, and I, I don't think I could do that. So I decided to make it in two sessions. I want to talk about uh, lovers of self, and then next week I want to talk about lovers of God. Okay? Uh, when you look at the title, how many of you love this title? I love this title. It's straight from the scripture. Uh, and it kind of explains the extreme to extreme kind of position. Okay? Lovers of self, and then there is lovers of God. Extreme to extreme. Polarity to polarity. North to south. Okay? I think it already speaks to us, right? Lovers of self and rather than the lovers of God. And I put rather than the lovers of God from the scripture. Put emphasis there. Isn't loving about heart activity? Is loving about superficial activity? Is love, loving about material activity? You buy flowers, you buy nice dinner. Is that loving? Absolutely not. You know, either that's one way to express your love, but love is about the heart, right? And I love this quote from Paul Tribb because it really, really uh, speaks to Christianity. The heart of the matter is the heart, okay? The heart of the matter is the heart. Loving self, loving God is heart activity. Loving your wife, loving your neighbor, neighbors is heart activity, right? So just want to start from that. And I want to read this text that Jay read so beautifully. Um, I just really analyzed that and put it, uh, put it together. And read it from one through five. One more time. Okay, look at this uh, screen. This is uh, third chapter of 2 Timothy, uh, the last letter of Paul, Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. There's no one like him, 13 books. Okay? No one like that in history. But God graced him, this someone who was supposed to put to death by God. He was an enemy of God, and God used him mightily. And this is the last writing of his, uh, uh, his writing of the scripture. Okay? Second to the last chapter. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Okay? People will be lovers of themselves or lovers of selves. Okay? Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, right down in the middle, disobedience to their parents, terrible times is coming. And ungrateful, unholy, unloving, and unforgiving. It's incredible, right? If you take out un from everywhere, it describes who God is, right? Grateful, holy, loving, and forgiving. But people become ungrateful, unholy, unloving, un, uh, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash and conceited, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to do with such people. Can I just remind you? This is the word of the Lord, right? Jay said that at the end, right? This is the word of the Lord. God who loves you and I so much, why would he put uh, such an extensive list of a disgusting qualities. Right? Why would he do that? Because he wants us to be really, really turned and uh, don't feel good on this Sunday. Is that why? Right? We have to think about that. Now, terrible time, times is coming. Terrible in what sense? Terrible in personal life. Terrible in your marriage. Right? Terrible in your family. Terrible in community and society and the city and the nation and between the nations. It's crazy what's going on in Syria right now. It's, it's unbelievable if you care, right? It is just 
unbelievable what's going on. Terrible time is coming. Why? What's so terrible, uh, terrible about this terrible times? It's the people. People will be lovers of self rather than the lovers of God. So here we see uh, in the third chapter of 2 Timothy, which is Paul's last writing, is an extensive list, 19 of them, okay? We're going to go through it really quick today. 19 of them of something disturbing. And I want to just remind you, it was inspired from the heart of God to his people because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because scripture is like a mirror, isn't it? It's like a mirror. We're going to talk about that, lovers of God, next week. Until scripture is open and you see the mirror of yourself, you will never go to God nor appreciate mercy at all. Right? What's so great about mercy and grace if you are such a great person? Right? So, God, through hand of Paul, he wanted uh, to write this because he loves us. And, and the list describes the people. Maybe you. 19 items, maybe nine, all of them, maybe some of them. I don't know. I was meditating on this. I'm like, I could probably go with most of them, if not all of them. All of them in me. Right? So in the last times, what does that mean? You know, we get kind of scared with that word, latter days or last days. Biblically speaking, theologically speaking, when Christ first came until Christ returns and consummate the world and history and come back as a king and a judge, anything in between, we call that latter days. Okay, we are living in the last days. We need to understand this, okay? And he's going to come this time uh, as the king, and as the judge, judge the living and the dead, and that is the gospel. Friends, you need to live in light of that. I need to live in light of that, okay? We do not know exactly when he's coming back, but we know two things for sure, I think. You know, number one, it is 2,000 years closer than when this was written. 2,000 years closer right now. So it's getting there, okay? And secondly, the Bible says the coming of the Lord is near. Okay, so I just want to start with that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about this lovers of self. What does that mean? Is that so bad? Lovers of God and everything in between 17 items all describes not spectrum, but everything describes lovers of self. And then there is lovers of God. It's 18 to 1 ratio. Okay, that's what it is. So what does that mean? Lovers of self versus lovers of God. Lovers of self, is, uh, uh, what is self-love? Is that so bad? Don't we supposed to love ourselves? Is that what the scripture is speaking about? No. John Calvin, the reformer, explained it this way. For so blindly do we all rush in the direction of self-love that everyone thinks he has a good reason to exalt himself. Therefore, oh no, there is no other remedy than to pluck up by the roots the most noxious pest, self-love, John Calvin. It's a pretty reliable name, okay? What is he saying? You know what self-love is? He's saying self-love is something deep inside of us. We want to exalt ourselves. We love ourselves. We want to worship ourselves. Who does? Every single one of you and me, okay? Let me use one more quote. Me is always at the bottom of all sin. Did you know that? Right? It may spell drink, lust, pride, covetousness, self-will, um, but it is some form of me. Okay? At the root of every sin, every form of sin, 17, 18, 19 things that we just read, at the bottom of it, at the root of it, me. Me. Okay? So I love the summary of Paul Tripp. And I think this is so helpful. If you could understand this, it really makes a difference in your Christian walk. Okay? Sin is extremely selfish. All you see is you. That's what sin is. Okay? Sin is you think you own the world. You think world revolves around you. You think I need to be the king. I need to be the God, actually. That's what sin is. Okay? Selfish, which means self-centered, self-focused. 
and therefore it is idolatry, idolatrous, which means worship of self. That's a, that's a pretty heavy word, self-worship, okay, Paul Tripp. Okay, self-worship, idolatry. Is that, is that really bad? Okay, let me explain this. Uh, and this is a little bit theological, and which is a little bit of preview of what I want to run for next several months uh, through the class of attributes of God. Because we really need to understand this. Okay? And we human hearts, all of your heart and my heart, husband's heart, wife's heart, father's heart, children's heart, are, we desire autonomy. Okay? Auto means self. Nami, autonomy, autonomy. What does that mean? It means self rule, self govern, self worship. That's what it is. We desire that. All of you and all of me. We were born like that. How many of you fathers teach your children to rebel against you? Right? You, need to, you, you, you need to rebel against me. You need to get up and you need to cry in the middle of the night. How many fathers teach their children? Nobody, right? But we automatically born with it. It's in our bone, it's in our, in, in our blood, and it's in, in our DNA. I think that just covers, you know, everything. Okay? Self-worship. Is that true? Is that so bad? Our heart desire very, very strongly, and we human beings desire autonomy, which means self-rule, self-government. We human beings are all rebellion against God. You know why? You know why? You know what the problem is? Here's the problem. What is the problem? When we want autonomy, we want to rule, we want to be, we want to be the king. What is the problem? You know what the problem is? God is the problem. That's a big problem. Right? What do you mean he's the problem? Because by definition, God is sovereign and God rules. And we want to rule and we want to be sovereign. Do you see the, do you see the problem? Okay. Come on, people. You got to see this. He is sovereign and he rules. And we desire so strongly to rule and we want to be sovereign, right? Self-worship is condition of human heart and every human heart. It's your heart. Do you ever wonder why marriage is so difficult? Do you ever wonder why parenting is so difficult? Do you ever wonder why living in this world is so difficult? Right? It's the human hearts. We want to be sovereign ourselves. And therefore, here's a big statement, okay? We hate God for it. The Bible says we are haters of God, you know? I think another way of saying lovers of self and lovers of God is object of wrath and objects of love. Those of you understand it, right? From the, straight from the scripture. Lovers of self, God, it's God's object of wrath. It's his holiness. He hates sharing his sovereignty. He's God, and we are not. And we desire that. We, we fight for that. We desire deeply from with, deep within us. Uh, we desire that. That's a big problem, okay? Let me give you an example, and this is Jim Boyce's uh, um, example, Pastor Jim Boyce, okay? And we go back to Genesis chapter 3, simple story of Adam, sin, how sin came into the world. You know, do you remember God created Adam, and God gave him everything, Okay? We always remember one tree, but God gave him everything. God gave uh, him everything, free to rule everything in the world, free to go anywhere in the world, free to do anything you wish, free to eat from anywhere in, in, in the garden, anywhere. In other words, Adam had everything. He had a sovereignty under him. He was a steward manager, right? But only one condition. What was that condition? not to eat from this one tree, one dinky tree, one tree that stood in the middle of the garden, the knowledge of good and evil. Can you picture with me? Adam did not have a bad, uh, bad deal. He had everything. He was free to go anywhere, do anything you want, eat anything you want, and he was the king, right? Under his kingship. Only one condition, don't eat of this one tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, what was that? What was that one tree about? Why did God do that? Is God mean God? If you think about it, he's not mean. He's so gracious. Why would he give human beings rule, uh, the right to rule everything? Eat anything you want. 
right? He's not a mean person. But what was that one tree? It was a symbol of the fact that Adam was, uh, Adam was not autonomous, okay? In other words, he's not a self-ruling person, but he was still God's creature, creation, right? And he owed his life and ultimate allegiance to God himself. That was the condition. That was the only thing. It wasn't the fruit itself. It wasn't the content of that fruit. It was just the relationship. It was just one covenant. Don't eat it. You could do anything you want. Do you, do you see the grace of God? Right? And then God warned him, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay? Do you remember? When you eat of it, you will surely die. And the tempter came, the snake came. Do you remember what the tempter said? When you eat of it, you will surely not die. Okay? Completely opposite. But when you eat of it, tempter says, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will be like God. What does that mean? You know, nothing could have been more irrational and ridiculous than Adam to eat of that one tree. Was it because of hunger? Was it because he didn't have anything else to eat? What was it? It was so irrational and ridiculous. For all these years, perhaps thousands of years, we don't, really don't know what the relationship between Adam and God is. It doesn't say, Bible doesn't say. Probably long years, good relationship, loving relationship, trusting relationship. God was always sincere to Adam. I believe he was sincere. I don't think God ever lied to Adam. Okay? Not only that, God always was caring for him. Therefore, Adam owed God unquestioning obedience. Don't you think? Absolutely. And God warned him, don't eat it, Adam. Don't eat it. If you eat it, you will surely die. You will surely die. You know, there's nothing to gain from eating that one fruit, right? It was so irrational, so illogical. Then what triggered it? What triggered this desire to eat that one fruit? It is, it is through, though he had everything, Adam had everything, this one tree, still Adam looked at that tree, and it was an offense to him. You know why? Because he desired to be autonomous, right? It meant limitation. It meant I can't do this beyond this. It represented something that he, he was not allowed to do. And Adam said, that tree is an offense to me and to my autonomy. That's the kind of heart we have, right? Until I am allowed to eat from that tree, I feel less than human, and I feel diminished. You know what? What the heck? I'm going to eat it, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to become a god. That's what sin is. That's the condition of human heart. That's your heart. Lovers of self. That's my heart. I'm not exaggerating. You probably think, oh, Pastor Paul is... I think he's too hyped right now. I'm not. Until you see it, cross doesn't mean anything. What's, what, what does cross mean to you? Right? It means nothing, right? Unless you see the real need. That's the condition of every human heart. We hate God. We hate His rule. We hate His sovereignty because we want to be sovereign. You want to be sovereign. Do you ever wonder why marriage is difficult? Do you ever wonder why church is difficult? Do you ever wonder why community is so difficult? Right? It's the people. It's the human beings. Right? We want to run our own lives. We want to be free. And we know we want no boundaries. Okay? So we hate God for it. Okay? How does Christianity work? I want to explain this real quick and then explain um, real in detail next week. Okay? Teacher, uh, one teacher of the law came to uh, Jesus and asked this question. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Which means, what is Christianity about? Okay, that's what it means. And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart. There it is, heart. With all your soul and mind and strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's the first. That's the greatest commandment. Jesus himself is saying, this is the biggest thing, loving God right and then second is like it love your neighbors as yourself 
And this law sums up the law and the prophet hangs on these two commandments. So did you know that Christianity is about loving God, by the way, and loving people? It's about love. It's not knowing it's love, but loving God. We call that worship, right? And loving our neighbors. Did you know that? It's about loving God and loving your neighbors. That's what Christianity is. A lot of people misunderstand that Christianity is about a lot of rituals and do this, do this. No, it's about loving God. It's about heart. It's about life. How could you love God with rituals? We love God with our heart. Right? And Jesus said that is the first and the greatest commandment. And second is, what about me? Loving your neighbors as yourself. Here's what we need to see. Where is me fit in all of these? In between the two. Right? As he loves me, then and only then we could love our neighbors, including your spouse. I'm so thankful, you know, people are, you know, getting married. I'm really thankful because I think that's the greatest ministry time, okay? And God placed such a huge meaning uh, in, in marriage and family. We talked about this last week. But can you imagine two self-ruling sinners and try to, uh, try to manipulate each other and try to do marriage. Can you imagine that kind of marriage? That's what people try to do, right? So where is me fitting, if, if fitting between the love of God and loving others, okay? Love your neighbors as yourself. And that sums up entire law and the prophets, which means entire Bible, which means every, uh, the whole Christianity is about loving God and loving his people. Now, problem is, okay, we'll talk about this next, uh, next week more. Problem is, if you don't know the love of God, only thing you know is love, your, love yourself. Then you know what? Your first and greatest commandment is to love you. And that's you without Christ. Your first and greatest commandment in your life and goal and mission and everything in your life is to love you and to rule others. People exist for me. And people worship me. So easy to do that, I think. Right? I want us to look at the list. Oh, Jesus Loves Me by Whitney Houston. I Googled it. That's what showed up first. Okay, Whitney Houston. She's, she added little verses. But Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Do you read the Bible? Oh. Pastor Paul, you treat us like little kids. No. I mean it. Because without reading it, how do you know God loves you? Do you know God loves you? I really mean it. Do you know God really loves you? How much is that? We are like that lovers of self. 18 qualities, that's me. But he still loves me. He still died for me. That's, isn't that the love? And I'm so convinced. All the, I've been doing this app for 28 years. Okay, ever since my college years. I knew uh, the heart of God is making disciples. Christ lovers and followers. It doesn't really matter how many deacons you raise. How many people you train. It doesn't really matter. So I'm not even talking about training aspect of Christianity. I'm talking about what you're becoming. Are you becoming a disciple of Christ? What does that mean? Followers of Christ. And how do you follow him? There's no way to follow him unless you love him. Did you know that? Don't you know that? Right. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you know? My brothers and sisters, do you know? Because how do you love others otherwise? What do you mean you love your wife? Are you kidding me? We are so self-centered, self-worshipping, idol, idolaters person. That's why people are bitter toward one another. That's why people just hate one another. Bible really speaks to me. Speak to his people that I love you. Although you are the scum of the earth, I still love you. That's what Christianity is, isn't it? Bible needs to be opened in your life. Disciples, if you want to follow Christ, Bible needs to be opened. There is no other way. Okay? I want to go over 19 things real quick. Lovers of self. Next on the list is lovers of money. We hate that expression, right? Especially in U.S., the most materialistic culture in the world in history, right? Right now. Imagine self-loving, loving yourself and greed. Do you think they go together? Of course. How many people you know who shops all the time for someone else? Right? It's always self-love, selfish love, and it's always greed. It's dangerous. Right next to it. Boastful, okay? Someone who loves himself so, exalted himself, full of himself, observed himself, always boast. That's the external manifestation of what is really happening in the inside. Do you know any, anybody like that? Are you like that? You know, think about that. You have to think about this. This is the list that God gave you. This is the word of God because he loves you, right? Boastful, outward, external manifestation of boastful. The word braggart. Okay, I got to explain this. Okay, braggart. Plato says that's something you are claiming that you do not have. That's a braggart. Okay, that's terrible. Okay, next, proud. It's a twin bro of boastful. You know, they're brothers. Being boasting and proud. When you are proud inside, you boast. That's a, that's a natural thing, right? And you're abusive, slanderous tongue, right? Slanderous tongue. And that's, and that's so sad. We have one mouth, Romans says, right? And we praise God and we curse others with the same mouth. Slanderous tongue. You know what, where it is coming from? Right here. Right here. Slanderous tongue comes from right here. Fountain of life. Your heart. Okay. I isolated this one a little bit because I think we need to pay attention to this one. Number six is disobedient to parents. I don't know what your relationship is like to your parents. I don't know what your relationship has been like with your parents. Right? I know there are a lot of faults I'm the fathers. I'm a father. But what about you? Are you a saint? Right? Seriously. Disobedience to parents. Sin and disobedience. Isn't disobedience sin? That's basically what it is. Why, do, why did Adam do that? Because he wants to be autonomous. He wants, he wants to, you know, uh, he loves himself. He wants to exalt himself. He wants to worship himself. He wants to be God. That's why. That's what disobedience is. Okay? Children rebelling. You never teach children to rebel, but they know how to do it. They know how to do it well, right? They know how to do it really, really well. Growing up with self-love, okay? Um, where is this coming from? John MacArthur gave a few reasons uh, about disobedience to parents, okay? Listen carefully if you, are, if you have a relationship problem with your parents. Okay. Number one, we human beings are born with, with a bent to selfishness, self-will, 
and disobedience. That's our sinful nature. Okay, that's our nature. And number two, mothers are in the workforce. We don't have, mothers don't have time to take care of the children and train the children, rebuke the children, raise them properly. This is John MacArthur, okay? Number three, fathers are not leading spiritually. I really believe in that, right? Or fathers are not there, period. Physically, emotionally, not there, okay? And lastly, exacerbated by teaching of culture of self-love in our society. So we're talking about nature, culture, and family. That's, that covers pretty much everything. That's why we have a relationship problem with our parents, disobedient to our parents. And here is the thing. Children who rebel against their parents will have no qualms about rebelling against anyone else, including your boss, anyone else, period. You grew up rebelling, you're going to rebel, right? It should be no surprise that a generation who natural to sinful self-love has been reinforced, justified by society is now undermining the family and the church. You know why family is difficult? Because we grew up like that. We grew up like that. You know why church is difficult? Because we are like that. Your heart is like that. My heart is like that. Number seven. Okay, going quickly. I love this list. Unlist. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Can you look at the list? Isn't it horrible? Can you imagine someone who's ungrateful, unholy, unloving, un unforgiving? And people become like that. Who becomes like that? People who love themselves without the grace of Christ. Naturally drift into that, okay? I want to talk a little bit about gratefulness. What's the problem with ungrateful? When you elevate yourself, when people give you something, you feel like you deserve it because you are up there, right? Because you are king. You're supposed to be served. You're supposed to be served, so you're not really grateful when people serve you. Now, the problem with that is it despises the idea of whole grace of God. You know why? You know what grace means? Grace means God is giving something good, although I don't deserve. That's what grace is, isn't it? I don't deserve it, but he gives to me something good. But if you feel like you deserve everything, what is grace to you? Ungrateful. Do you feel like this generation is ungrateful? Most noxious sin to God. God hates the sin, right? Unholy, unloving, heartless. I'm, I'm going quickly. And I want to talk about this, unforgiving. These are the people who are beyond reasoning. They don't want to be forgiven. They don't want to forgive. They don't care. That's how you become, because when you are so elevated, you can forgive someone because you are just beyond reasoning. I want to talk about this one thing a little bit. Slanderous, okay? Which means malicious gossip. I think this is number one cause of church problems anywhere in the world. Gossip. In our membership class last week, 15 people joined the class and they signed the covenant and became a member of our church and they committed. And one of the things that you signed is that I'm not going to gossip. You know why? Gossip destroys the church. Right? What is slanderous means? Perverse pleasure of damaging other people's opinion. You're just, you just enjoy that. Whether it is because of jealousy, whether it is your, of your brokenness, whether it is the, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but you enjoy it. And the word slanderous is diabolus. This is not an Italian food, um, you know, thing, diabolus. Which means accuser. It shows up 34 times in the New Testament. And it is the name of Satan himself. Satan himself. You know what gossip is? Work of Satan. P 
period. That's just basically what it is. Okay, two more, uh, just a few more. Without self-control, addiction. We should talk about this. You know what addiction is? Modern slavery, self-worship. That's what addiction is. Okay, brutality. You hear about this news is in Korea. Incredible things are happening in Korea right now. I don't want to say it. Some of you know, right? Fathers. Yeah, I don't. Want, I don't want to say it. Brutal. They become brutal. Lovers of good. Oh, excuse me. Not lovers of good. Isn't that so perverted? Don't we supposed to love good? But we don't like good. Not lovers of good. And you become treacherous, which means betray. You betray, which is opposite of, I think, faithfulness. Right? And you become so rash and reckless, you don't care. You know? And then lastly, you become conceited. And the last one, finally, is lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay? See, uh, up to here, 18 of them, we're describing lovers of self, and then there is lovers of God. Do you think all these qualities deserve wrath of God? We like to use that word. I don't deserve it. I mean, I deserve it. Do you think you deserve the wrath of God? Okay. What does that mean? Jo uh, lovers of pleasure and rather than the lovers. Lovers of God. Okay. Lovers of pleasure. It doesn't mean you just enjoy like going on a vacation and you party and drink, whatever. But it's a perverted joy because of your, your nature of your heart. You enjoy and get satisfaction from malicious gossip, brutality, and treachery. A depraved pleasure, if you, pleasure, if you will. And what I want you to focus is lovers of pleasure, not more than God. So you love God this much and you love pleasure this much. No, it's, it doesn't say that. You are lovers of pleasure rather than God. Do you see it, how perverted it is? Jesus uh, described it this way in John's Gospel. The light came into this world, but people love darkness more than the light. And he explains why. Because their deeds are evil. You know why we love darkness? Because our heart is evil. Okay? Okay, I'm sorry to uh, depress you so much today. I don't mean to. Because unless we see the problem there's no hope for healing unless we have the diagnosis how do you treat unless you see your problem what's grace who's christ who cares right bible lists these things for you and me so that it mirrors us do you feel like you're unloving Ungrateful, not lovers of good, disobedient to parents, slanderous, conceited, brutal, brutal. You're proud, you're abusive, you're betraying. Do you feel like that? Then you have hope. Then you have hope. Okay? What do we do with these conditions? Where do we go? What do we do with ourselves? If God graces us and be, began to see these things about you, me, right? Not others, about you. What do you do? What are you supposed to do? If anyone wants to be my disciples or different virgin says, if you want to follow me, Jesus said, three things. Deny it first. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. And follow me now I always wondered what this meant I really wondered okay taking up his cross following him but what does that mean to deny self you must 
deny self. There is no stronger expression in the Bible, in the scripture, that's, uh, that more than must. I think that's the way English language is too. Is there anything stronger than must? Jesus said, you must. You want to follow me? You must deny yourself. I think the key word is deny. Okay? What does that mean? Disown, reject yourself. Right? Your selfishness. Your wickedness. You have to see it. I think that pretty much describes in 2 Timothy. Right? You have to see it. We got to see our condition, illness, and diagnosis of your heart. Your heart. Come on, people. You may grow old another 30 years without dealing with this. Can you imagine that? What kind of monster are we going to become? Literally a monster. Isn't that a monster? I think that's pretty much monster. Bible says in Psalm 73, without the grace of God, we become brutal animals. We're worse than animals. If you see in your heart, I love darkness more than the light. I want nobody's rule. I want, I want to be autonomous. I want to rule my world. I hate everyone, including God, who put boundaries in myself. For I don't want to obey nobody. If that's you and you begin to see it, you have hope, I think. You have hope. Okay? Paul saw it in Romans chapter 7, 23. Those of you who follow Romans right now in Bible reading, we just passed it recently. Romans chapter 8 is an incredible chapter. And Romans chapter 7, which is before that, this is what Paul says. But I see another law work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of sin work within me. You know, Paul says, the things that I want to do, I can't do, I don't do. Things that I don't want to do, I do. That's perverse, right? That's, that's slavery. I want to be nice to be my wife. I want to be really kind to my children, but I can't do it. I don't want to yell at people, but I see myself keep yelling at people. That's what Paul, Paul is saying. I'm a slave to sin working in me. And then what happened? What a wretched man I am. Who's, who's saying this? Paul is saying this. Okay. Paul is saying, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of subject of death? And then he looked to Christ. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. That's the right order, isn't it? Message of Jesus means nothing to you unless you see it. Who's going to rescue me? I'm a decent person. I'm a you know, tax-paying citizen of the United States. I'm a deacon in the church. My family is okay. Right? Then and only then, you will look to Christ. And what do we have to do? I have been, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? You die with Him. What do you have to do with yourself? What do you have to do with I? Self-exalting, sinful nature of yours? You need to die. That's what scripture is saying. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I meditate about this more and more these days. Although I recited this particular verse more than several thousand times ever since I was ordained, this is the verse that the Lord gave me uh, for my ordination, my calling. I meditate about this. I think that's what Christianity is. I have been crucified with Christ. I am that 18th uh, adjective person, slanderous person, gossip person, right? Unholy person, treacherous person. That's all of me, but with all of that sin, I become one with the blood of Christ. What happens then? Sin and blood of Christ. Blood cleanses me. Right? Without shedding of the blood, there is no cleansing of sin. 
Isn't that what Christianity is? I've been crucified with, with him. We're going to do baptism, I mean, uh, uh, communion in a few minutes. You know what that represents? Blood of Christ and the body of Christ, death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and being united with him. Do you see the need in your life? Just to make your marriage better? No, that's not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying. Just so that I could quit whatever? No, that's not what I'm saying. Right? You have no option. I have no option. Seeing your heart is very important. Then look to Christ and sing His heart. Very, very important. Which is first? You know, I've been struggling about this. Is, is it eggs or is it chicken? Do I need to see Him first? Do I need to see myself first? Do you ever think about this? I think a lot of people don't know him and don't know you. And we do try to do Christianity. But we need to know both. I, 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 I think about this, which is first, chicken or eggs? And I think, it doesn't matter. When I see Luke chapter 15, when I see Paul, I think it happens simultaneously, together. Right? It doesn't matter which comes first, but it has to. We have to see God's heart, His love, and we have to see my wickedness. And I say my wickedness. Okay? Then be united with Him. I have been crucified with Christ. And repent. I want to emphasize this word. You need to repent. You need to repent and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Every single one of you. Okay? You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And falling in love with Him. I think that's what happens. We'll, we'll talk about this next week. Are you falling in love with Him? If not, you're not following Him. You're just living. Right? And then you could love others. Loving God and loving others. Christianity. Jesus loves me, this I know. And I want to ask you this question just one more time, just, just to bug you. Is Scripture speaking to you about love of God in your life? Are you reading? Are you communing? I really have to speak this. It should be before Piper and Keller books. Please. It should be before Piper and Keller books. They're not the saviors of, of, of this world. Please. Read it as a supplements, not as a main course. Right? Please. Just want to close with this uh, thing. Self is opaque veil that hides the face of God from us. Okay? That's self. It's the opaque veil that hides the face of God from us. That's what stops you from seeing God. What do you have to do? You're going to have to put it down at the feet of Jesus like Mary. You're going to have to put yourself down at the feet of Jesus like Mary. Let's pray.